Welcome to Chapter 8, Part 2, the recording, uh, so we can spend a little more time in class doing problems. So here is where we kind of left off, was talking about combination reactions. And when you look at these combination reactions, you're basically taking the uh, idea is to take this gas, the nonmetal hydride, nonmetal oxide, and combining it with water to make a oxyacid. So let's do an example of how you balance that last one here to show you how that works through. Um, so since you don't get to keep the, the A's and the B's, they don't kind of stay together, for this last one you have to kind of break those apart. And so when you go through and account for um, those atoms, you know that you have uh, two nitrogens on this side. So then if you have one to begin with on this side, um, there you need to multiply the whole thing by two, so that gives you two overall. So then the nitrogens are balanced. Uh, then you go to the next, uh, which would be hydrogens. We'll start there because we have oxygen in both of these. So we're going to uh, go to the hydrogens. Here we have two hydrogens on this side. That two in front gives us two here. So those are balanced. And then lastly, we're going to go with oxygens. We have uh, five on this side. And then one for a total of six on this side. We end up having two times three, which equals six. So those are balanced. So that two will give us that balanced reaction. So step by step go through those. And if the A and B were to stay similar and they would stay in their ionics as they come across, then you could use those. Since these break up, then you can't. So so you make that process and go through those. Uh, next is decomposition reactions. <clears throat> so this is where you basically have a compound and it breaks down into something else. Usually your decomposition reactions take a little bit of activation energy to get that started. And then break down into something plus a gas. So in this case, uh, we have uh, mercury and lead oxides, metal oxides that decompose into the metal, <clears throat> to some kind of metal, and then, then the gas comes off. And so we have two examples here of that process, mercury going to the mercury metal, and then giving off uh, the oxygen gas. And when we balance that out, once again, we have two mercuries, we have two oxygens, oxygen is diatomic, uh, and then the other one we have a lead oxide. Uh, turning into another lead oxide, so a different version of a lead oxide. So it decomposes into this different version and then gives off oxygen gas. So that's an example of that decomposition reaction. Uh, and this takes you through then the process of some metal carbonates that form metal oxides and carbon dioxide, and then metal bicarbonates uh, that form metal carbonates, uh, carbon dioxide, and water. So it breaks down then, and this last one, once again, you then have to go through and account uh, for all the atoms that are in there. So if we start accounting for these, uh, if we take sodium, which is the first one, we have one on this side, and we have two over here, because uh, CO3 happens to have a, a minus uh, two charge. So to make that balanced, because we all know that all compounds are neutral. Um, so then we can go over and say, okay, to get that 2 to be on this side, we have to put a 2 in front of this. So then that becomes 2. Uh, then we'll start taking over and taking a look at other options for the other elements. Start with, uh, with uh, carbon. We have 2 because of the 2 in front. And then we have to look and see how many carbons we have going across. So here's the 1 carbon. Here's another one. So 1 plus 1 equals the two for carbons. So that's balanced. So we have sodium balanced, carbon balanced. Uh, then we can take a look at hydrogen because it's in one thing on this side, one of the uh, reactants, and it's in one product. So that might be easier to balance. So once again, we have two times hydrogen. So we have two hydrogens on this side. We have two on this side. So that's balanced. So carbons were balanced. And now we can look at the oxygen and see how that works out. 
we have 2 times 3 equaling 6 on this side. And we have to see how many we have on this side. So we have 3 plus 2 plus 1. equals 6. So then that's balanced with the addition of that coefficient in front of there. So here's an example of decomposition. Some more examples of giving off some oxygen as they decompose. So you have a single displacement reaction where you have uh, one metal or a nonmetal. Uh, then they form to, to, to then create those compounds. So your metal, uh, when the metal reacts with hydrochloric acid, you make that uh, zinc chloride, which is aqueous, and then the bubbles gives off the gas. So that's an example of that uh, single displacement where one thing displaces another. So here's our activity series. This is how we can tell uh, whether or not a particular um, action, if a particular reaction is going to occur. So uh, the more active an element is, uh, it replaces the less active elements. So when you look at this list, you have an increasing activity as you go you know, up the periodic table. So in this case, anything below potassium Potassium is the most active because it is the highest on that list. It is the most reactive. It will replace anything else. So when, when potassium reacts with anything else, it will replace it because it is the most active. And then you just basically go down the line from there. So in this case, when you have aluminum and uh, reacting with uh, copper, is aluminum above copper on the list? So you look at aluminum, you look at copper. Since aluminum is above copper, aluminum will replace it. And then we have... Uh, Mercury and copper. In this case, mercury is below copper on the list, so it will not replace it. And that's how you can tell those reactions occur. It's because of that activity series. So to kind of go through this chart, the uh, balancing on top, to give you an example of that, how that works. We know that Cl is a minus 1, so both of them together is a minus 2. So copper must be a plus 2, that to be balanced. So when we go over here to this side, we know that Cl is a minus 1. Aluminum in this case then, because if together they're a minus 3, then uh, together they're a minus 3, so then aluminum must be a plus 3. So now we then know that everything's, all the compounds are then correct, and we can go back in and double check on the coefficients to make sure we're going to balance the equation. So we start out with aluminums. We know that at least to begin with, we have one of each. So then that would be balanced at this moment. We then go to the coppers. So before the coefficients are on there, there's one of each. So they're balanced at this moment. Now we look at the chlorines. Well, we have two chlorines on this side, and we have three on the other side. So we're never going to get those to balance that necessarily that way. So we know that we're going to have to have, once again, three times the two to give us six on this side and then 2 times the 3 to give us 6 on that side. Or what you could do is do the halves. We know we have 3 on this side, so then we would then go in and say, okay, I need 3 halves 
to do this. So our kind of our first set of balancing would be, okay, I have one, three halves, one, and then to get the coppers right, you're going to have two-thirds, basically, over there, because you're going to have to do this. So when you multiply everything by two, and you end up having two, three, two, and then the three gives you three coppers, so you end up having three over here when you're all done. So that's how you get to those coefficients, balancing that particular reaction. All right, so if we look at this series, and we know that A will not replace H, but B will replace H, then how do we then organize these? So if we know that H is greater than A, and we know that B is greater than H, then we can say, or if we use the examples here, the less thans, we can rewrite these as less thans. A is less than H, and H is less than B. So then we can write that as A is less than H, which is less than B. All right. Single displacement reactions are the metal and the acid that creates a hydrogen gas and a salt. And in this case, uh, since copper, you need to compare copper and hydrogen. Since copper is below hydrogen, then there's no reaction. We compare iron and hydrogen. Iron and hydrogen, since iron's above hydrogen, therefore we have a reaction to occur. So the activity series will let you know when those reactions will occur. Here's a couple more examples of the potassium uh, plus water to make potassium hydroxide and iron plus water to make iron oxide. Here are the metals. Once again, a couple examples. We have tin and silver. When we take a look at tin, and then we take a look at silver. Since tin is above silver, you'll have a reaction. When we compare zinc to aluminum, we have zinc and aluminum. Zinc is below aluminum, so therefore no reaction. So if you start where you're starting, here I started with zinc, and my line goes up to aluminum, no reaction. Start with my tin, and I went down to silver, then a reaction. Same thing with the halogens. When you have sodium um, and those, uh, when you have comparing those halogens, since you have iodine and chlorine, and we have fluorine. So once again, if we take a look at the fluorine and the chlorine, here we have fluorine where we're starting, and we're going to chlorine. Since we went down, then of course there's a reaction. We're looking at iodine and chlorine. Here's chlorine, here's iodine. So we're going from iodine to chlorine. We went up, no reaction. All right, we have the reaction of barium uh, and uh, 
platinum chloride. Uh, and then we're then asking if it will occur. So um, will occur if. So we know this will occur if, which one of these is true? So if we're going to replace, if we're going to go from barium and we're going to replace then the platinum, then we need to know then that barium has to be more active than platinum because it has to replace that. So that would be the answer because it's replacing the two, the positive thing is replacing the positive thing. So the most likely products of the reaction between aluminum and nickel uh, chloride. So you need to look at those. Take a look at aluminum. And then take a look at nickel. So we're going from aluminum to nickel. So we will have a reaction. So therefore then we're going to then have the replacement. So we'll have the aluminum replace or displace the nickel. So we're going to have an AlCl compound. And since aluminum, you know, uh, chlorine is a uh, minus one, and uh, aluminum is a plus three, I think, from your ion chart. So then we're going to have three of those to balance. See if I got that ion correct here. Yeah. Double displacement, stuff we did in lab. So we have the A and the B, C and the D to make those other ones. So when you think about that, think make sure you understand or remember or can memorize plus and the minus plus and the minus, yielding a plus and a minus, and a plus and a minus. So this A substitutes for that. And you get an AD and a CB left over. So you have the evidence, you have the heat, solid precipitates, and or gas bubbles when you're making the gas. Uh, neutralization reactions are double displacements, special kinds of double displacements where you end up having heat as well. And so to uh, make this particular reaction completely proper, we should make sure that we add heat at the end. And that will tell you that's one of the products. Once again, remember, if it helps you during the balancing process, instead of writing water, write HOH. Because H is the plus thing, OH is the minus thing. If that helps you, then write it that way instead. Write it HOH, hydrogen hydroxide versus water. Because then you can keep those letters, the A's and B's together. So when you draw that and you then lo look at that, then you can go through and divide each one of these into its parts. So then you have the A and the B and the C and the D and they combine and you have C here and you have the B there and then you have the A here and you have the D on this side to combine with one another. We have a metal oxide, plus the acid gives you salt in the water to, from that particular reaction. We have precipitate forms. And remember, you're going to then, to be able to, to, don to note that, you have to then put the solid after to, to let you know that that precipitate came out. Uh, and that can, comes from your solubility table. 
couple examples of that going through that process remember if I didn't if I had not given you this on this side if that wasn't a given then when you start to do the balancing process when you make those compounds you start out with the plus and the minus this happens to be a minus one So then this is going to help. Why would this be a 2 to 2? I think this is wrong. No, this, this is wrong. This is wrong because we wouldn't have a 2 to 2 ratio here. Maybe we wouldn't have a 2 to 2 ratio here either. So that reaction was written wrong on there. So if that's a minus 1. This is a plus 1. Then when you then move them over, you're going to have a minus 1 here, plus 1 there minus one plus one make sure that remember it's always that lowest level of reactions so then if you're going to balance those out then you would have you would not need two cl's you would not need this you would not need that so that reaction was unfortunately wrong on that piece so that would be the proper way to balance that reaction See if the top one's right here. So four minus two plus one. Two of them together is a plus two. Minus one minus two plus two. That looks good. Minus two plus two minus one plus one. Good. So the compounds are correct. Now I can double check the coefficients to make sure they're right. So I have 1 BA, 1 BA. I have 1 SO4, 1 SO4. I have 2 sodium, so I have to have the 2 in front there. When I do that, I need 2 chlorines, 2 here, and 2 there. So that's balanced correctly. All right. So that one looks okay. We have a double displacement with gas formation. Minus two for sulfur, plus one to those. That one looks good. So we have the sulfuric acid, uh, sodium cyanate, plus two, minus two, minus one, plus one for those. That looks balanced correctly. And these are the ones that will also decompose. So then you have your second step involved there, where you have the gas decomposing into, then the uh, give off, it comes off as a gas, they so decompose into that gas. That's what you did in lab. So three HCl that looks right. So that's balanced correctly. You have the NH4 gas. Okay, so this bottom one is where things are going to get a little dicey because things don't stay. Our OH this does not stay over here. So then we have to then when no, so as we notice that then we know that we're going to have to break that up and then balance this by element. So one thing that does stay is we do have the NO3 that stays. So let's keep that as a unit. So then we know we have one of them on this side, one on that side. So that's balanced. We know we have one sodium. That's balanced. We have an OH. If we write this again as HOH, then we know then we have one OH here and one OH there. So that balances. Then we go back and do the stuff that doesn't with the, the ammonia on this side. So we have one nitrogen, one nitrogen. That balances. 
and then we have uh, four hydrogens on this side. So we have to come up with four hydrogens on this side. So we have three and one plus those equals four. So that balances as well. All right, what are the likely products of a reaction of copper to oxide with nitric acid? So you have to write down those compounds. So we have copper to oxide, so CuO. We have oxide, which is a minus 2, copper 2, which is a plus 2, so that's good. We have CuO. And then we have nitric acid, which is H and O3. And so we have a minus one and a plus one. So we have H and O3. So we add those together. We then could have then a copper substituting for the hydrogen. So we have copper nitrate. This is a plus, a minus one, that's a plus two, so we have to have two of those to balance. Plus we have then um, the other ones switch over, and we have then um, our H uh, O. Right? Copper and then H and O. Correct. And so then that's going to form, then we need two of those to make the water. Uh, so now we, have, now we have the compounds correct. We can go back and do the balancing and then say, okay, we have our one copper, we have our one copper, we have then our one NaOH, and we have two here, so we have to put a two there to get those to balance, uh, and then we can do our um, H's. We have two H's here, which balance, and one O that balances. So that's correct. Okay. Uh, what are the likely products of a reaction of sodium sulfide and iron 3 chloride? So if we have then uh, that reaction, we have the iron 3 chloride. Since we know that it's iron 3, we then could make the chloride because it's a minus one. This is a plus three, so we have to have three of those. We have the sodium sulfide. So we have sodium, which is a plus one, sulfide, which is a minus two. So we have to have two of those to make that balance for a plus two overall. This is a minus three overall. And then we're going to then make the products. So the iron is going to then displace the sodium. Once again, you don't use the, uh, the subscripts when you're making the uh, products. So you then you're going to have the Fe, which is a plus 3. Then you have the S, which is a minus 2. Then you need two of those for a plus 6 and a minus 6. And then we have the, self, then we have the sodium, plus 1, minus 1. So then we have the compounds are correct. So now we can go back and do the balancing. So now we can double check these coefficients to see if they're right. I have, I had to begin with, I have two Fe's over here. So I need two here, so I put the two in front, so that takes care of that coefficient. Two in front of that gives me six chlorines. Two times three is six. So then I have to then account for that over here with the six in front of the chlorines. Uh, that's going to give me six Sodiums I have to then account for. I have two to begin with here, so the three in front of there gives me six. And then lastly then, I have then the three times one sulfur, uh, which gives me the three sulfurs. And then the one in front of here times the three gives me three. So those are all balanced. So that those particular coefficients were correct. All right. 
what are the likely products of a reaction of sodium hydrogen carbonate with hydrochloric acid. So then we have then the sodium hydrogen carbonate, the plus and the minus. We have hydrochloric acid, the plus and the minus. And then what's that going to form? So when we then form those products, then we then can switch those. We know that sodium is a plus one, and then the hydrogen carbonate then would be a minus one. Part of that will be on the atomic sheets, plus one, minus one. So then we can go through and do the formation. And so then we do our first step in that formation, um, which is going to be then the sodium goes with the chloride. So sodium chloride is our first product. And then the hydrogen is going to then go with the hydrogen carbonate. So hydrogen, hydrogen carbonate, which we would write as H2CO3. And we know um, then that is going to go through then the process of decomposing. So that's going to decompose. And we're going to get this H2CO3 is going to decompose into CO2 plus H2O. So then we know our final products are going to be these down here of the NaCl from our first reaction and then the decomposition of our um, carbonic acid will then give you these two from here. Let me can double check to see if they're balanced correctly. We got one and one, and we got a Cl and a Cl. Uh, we have a C and a C carbon. Uh, we then can do the hydrogens. We have one and one makes two hydrogens. And there's the two hydrogens there. And then we can do the oxygens. We have three on this side. And we have one plus two equals three on this side. Check. So that's bounced correctly. Okay. Heat of reaction, exothermic versus endothermic. What does that mean when we have that reaction and we have the heat? Endothermic reactions take energy or absorb heat to make them work. That was the activation energy we talked about. In general, this activation energy, if it's small, if it's just a little bit of energy, then we usually don't write it as a separate amount. If it just takes a tiny bit of energy to make it started, then we usually don't always write it then that way. So this is probably a little bit more than just activation energy. It's actual amounts of energy. So this thing, when this occurs, this will be cold. So this is, ends up being a cold reaction. If you touch this reaction, it'll feel cold because it's absorbing heat to make it work. Exothermic reactions give off heat. They're hot. So there might be a little bit of heat you take these two solids and put them together, they might not start working until you put a little bit of heat in there. So there might be a bit of activation energy here that starts it, but once it starts, then it would just go because then it produces, after the first couple molecules get produced, it produces enough heat to then make the rest of the reaction occur. So you might give it a spark, kind of like gasoline, you give it a spark that starts and then boom, it just continues to burn. So you take a little bit of energy to start it, and then it continues to go. So some of these exothermic reactions, the balance, the overall result is it takes, sometimes it takes a little bit of heat to start them, but there's more heat given off in the end. So overall, the reaction gives off heat 
as a result. So the amount of heat absorbed or released is the heat of the reaction. So here's an example of an endothermic reaction, one of those ice packs. So when you break those seals and shake them, the chemical reaction occurs and it absorbs heat to make the products. So then you have this change of potential energy. So down here we have kinetic energy, the energy of motion, and up here we have potential energy. That's usually chemical energy. So you have chemical energy up there. And so when this goes through the process then, you give it some energy to start, you have the reactants, you give it some energy to start, and then boom, it drops down again. So that difference is this heat of the reaction. So overall, you go from a state of less potential energy to a state of more potential energy. You go from that state of the reactants to the products, where you have higher potential energy, therefore more chemical energy, therefore it's endothermic. You put energy in to get there. So you have to put energy in to the reaction to get from here to there. Energy goes in. So you have the activation energy on this side. What does it take to make the uh, reaction occur? And then you have the energy that comes back out again. Overall, you have to put energy in to make this happen. So that's endothermic. Energy has to go in to create a higher potential energy at the very end. The exact opposite occurs in exothermic reactions. So once again, we have our kinetic energy, our higher kinetic energy down here and higher potential energy up here. Motion and then chemical. So then when you start the reaction, you have the the reactants here, and they move in this direction, you have the activation energy, what it takes to make that reaction occur. You have that, that this amount of energy right here that takes to make that reaction occur, and then you get the heat of the reaction coming off. It gets hot. So when you subtract these two, the amount you put in to make it happen, and the amount that comes back out again, so this is the energy in, this is the energy out. When you subtract those two, you end up having more energy coming out. So more out makes it exothermic. It's hot. It burns. It makes things move faster. Things that are on fire move faster. More kinetic energy. So we have this reaction. <coughs> we have hydrogen gas plus iodine gas plus energy gives us hydrogen iodine. D. When one mole of hydrogen is produced, how much of the energy is going to be, what's going to happen to the energy? Okay. So we know that for every two moles, of hydrogen iodine that you produce, it takes twelve point six kilojoules of energy. So that energy is absorbed. So when it's absorbed, then what's going to happen? So for one mole of H I, it'll take half as much. So then you basically divide the 12.6 by, by 2, because you went from that ratio of 2 to 1, and then it equals to 6. 
point three. Global warming. So this is uh, talking the the gas the greenhouse effect. So it talks about when you have radiation from the sun hitting the earth, what's going to happen? Well, you have the light coming in, hits the earth. Some reflects out, some is absorbed, and different kinds of molecules absorb different amounts of energy. So here it talks about the molecules of carbon dioxide and water absorb energy that are coming back out. So they reflect off the surface of the earth, and as they're leaving, they get absorbed, and they're, then they're kept inside of the atmosphere. So you have your atmosphere here that's made up of these gases, and as you have more carbon dioxide and more water gases in there, it acts as a blanket. So it doesn't stop the energy coming in. What it does is it absorbs the energy that's coming back out again. It has the heat, and then it radiates, so the light comes in as visible light, and then when it hits the earth and is absorbed, it gets radiated back as heat. So that heat comes back out. So when that heat comes out, it gets absorbed by those molecules, and then it stays. It gets trapped. And so that's the greenhouse effect, is that heat is kept in. So that's the, the problem with those gases. We have too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, is that it traps the heat coming out. So here's the increase of carbon dioxide over the course of the last 100 years. You can see that it's dramatically increased over the last couple hundred years. And so these are the problems. Thank you.